In 1954, Leslie Irvin, the mad dog killer, shocked the Tri-State with six vicious murders. While his actions shook the area, they also had national repercussions. His trial would have lasting effects on how the 14th Amendment applied to American citizens. In 1954, Evansville, Indiana was a typical city. Evansville prided itself on being a good town and a great place to raise a family because it had a good economy, a great job market, and a population of around 120,000. In December, citizens were out Christmas shopping. Children were safe in school, and for the most part, all was well. However, Evansville was about to be struck with tragedy and fear. On a cold, dark December night, Leslie Irvin was about to commit his first of six murders. Mary Holland was working at a local liquor store on Bellmead Avenue. Leslie Irvin walked into the store and pointed a gun at Holland. Irvin forced her to open the cash register drawer. He then took the money and walked Holland into the restroom. Holland kneeled down in front of the toilet as Irvin aimed the gun at Holland's head and pulled the trigger. Later that month, the killing would continue. On December 23rd, the body of Wesley Kerr was found in a gas station bathroom. Kerr had died from a single bullet to the back of the head. Police came to the conclusion that whoever killed Wesley Kerr also killed Mary Holland. News spread quickly that a serial killer was among the Tri-State. Gun sales rose, parents kept their children inside, and the Tri-State lived in fear. On March 21, 1955, Irvin would strike again, this time killing Wilhelmina Saylor of Mount Vernon, Indiana. Sailor, like the others, had been killed by a single bullet to the head. Seven days later, on March 28th, the Mad Dog Killer chose a family as his next victims. Raymond, Gable, and Elizabeth Duncan were all found dead in their home. However, Irvin hadn't killed the entire Duncan household. Mamie Duncan was left alive, although she was blinded from the gunshot wound. News spread quickly about the Duncan massacre, and the Tri-State was stricken with fear. However, on April 8th, 11 days after the Duncan Massacre, Leslie Irvin was arrested near Yankeetown, Indiana. Irvin was picked up because he matched the description of a local burglar. Police told reporters that the suspect's car had been seen in the area of the break-ins, which was near the location of some of the murders. They also found traces of soil from the Ohio River in Irvin's shoes, which is where the Duncans were found. Once Irvin was arrested, he was placed in the Vandenberg County Jail without bond. Next began the long legal process to try Irvin for the murders. On uh, April 20th, Leslie Irvin's case went to the grand jury. They heard the evidence from uh, the killings of Mary Holland and Wesley Kerr. Meanwhile, Henderson and Posey County were also uh, looking into the matter. It was later, indictment came from Posey County around the time of his trial in uh, November and December of 1955. Henderson County went ahead and took the case to the grand jury and they issued an indictment against Leslie Irvin on May the 2nd. The Henderson Sheriff's Office was determined to pursue Leslie Irvin. Uh, and there was, for a while, there was a back and forth battle, you could say, uh, in which county, Vanderburg or Henderson County, would actually prosecute Leslie Irvin. Nearly five months had passed, and now a Vanderburg County jury was finally ready to be seated. Irvin had changed defense attorneys from Robert Hayes to Ted Lockyer and James Lopp. The trial was to take place in Princeton, Indiana, due to the massive amount of pretrial publicity in the tri-state area. Even with the trial being held 38 miles away in Princeton, it still took over a month to select a just jury. Finally, on December 10, 1955, eight months after Leslie Irvin had been arrested, the trial began. Irvin told Evansville police where he had thrown the guns after the murders. Since all three guns were found and Irvin's car was seen near the area, it took only 10 days for the jury to decide that Leslie Irvin was guilty on all counts of murder. He was sentenced to death by electric chair. The execution date was set for July 12, 1955. While Irvin sat on death row, counting on the days before death, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Using a cardboard and aluminum foil key, Leslie Irvin unlocked a series of doors and escaped from the Princeton jail. People began to report sightings of Leslie Irvin. Some reportedly saw Irvin in Evansville. 
Some said Irvin was out in Colorado. The media posted the false sightings in the papers. The tri-state was once again in fear, not knowing where the Mad Dog Killer was and if he would strike again. A nationwide manhunt began for Irvin. Law enforcement across the nation got involved in the capture of Irvin. The FBI even joined the search and posted wanted posters all across the nation. A month later, while Irvin was pawning off stolen jewels in a San Francisco pawn shop, two cops arrested Irvin. Later, they would find out that Irvin was a runaway fugitive. From there, he was escorted by car back to death row in the Indiana State Prison. Irvin's attorneys worked feverishly to prevent Irvin from facing the death penalty. Leslie Irvin uh, had uh, several tr uh, dates in which he was supposed to be executed. Initially, of course, June 1956. That was later changed to December 1st of that year. And then 1957 in March, and then in July 1957. The July execution date was the closest that he would come to actually being executed. Lockyer and Lopp continued to appeal their client's case until their second petition to the United States Supreme Court was granted. On November 9, 1960, the U.S. Supreme Court was presented with the case of Irvin v. A.F. Dowd. After hearing the evidence of the case, the court came to a conclusion. On June 5, 1961, Justice Tom Clark wrote about the ruling of the case. With his life at stake, it is not requiring too much that Irvin be tried in an atmosphere undisturbed by so huge a wave of public passion and by a jury in which two-thirds of the members admit, before hearing any testimony, to possessing a belief in his guilt. On May 20, 1962, the second trial would begin in Sullivan County. Nearly six years after the original trial began, Leslie Irvin would finally be sentenced to life in prison. The Irvin v. Dowd case marked the first time the High Court had overturned a conviction because of pretrial publicity. The decision altered the way newspapers, radio, and television covered the criminal cases and the way authorities released information. The case would be cited in journalism law classes all over the country. Leslie Mad Dog Irvin died behind bars from lung cancer on November 9, 1983. Many things have been learned from this case. The media has learned the limits and changes have been made. The courts have now learned how to handle these types of cases because of this landmark case, Irvin v. Dowd.